So it is my great pleasure to introduce Hanu Singh. Um, he's a professor at Northeastern University. And up until two years ago, he was at the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institute, or short GUI, um, uh, where he was a staff member and uh, developed um, underwater, autonomous underwater vehicles, autonomous surface vehicles, and participated in research missions, working with scientists from Antarctica to Arctic. Um, and originally got his MIT, uh, his PhD from MIT, Woods Hole program, joint program. Yep. And so with this, I'm sure we're in for, for a good treat here. All right, thank you so much, Michael. Okay, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about um, some of the stuff we've been doing for a long period of time. Uh, we like to say our lab is bipolar. We work both in the Arctic and the Antarctic. And then um, we do a bunch of applications, but I'm gonna try and focus in on a few of them and, uh, and we'll see how that goes. And again, the great thing about um, this is a relatively nice and small audience is if you guys want to interrupt me, if you have questions, you know, feel free. It should be, uh, it should be a two-way street, okay? So, you know, here we are. Uh, I'm going to start talking about our stuff. 2007 was a watershed moment for us. We went out and we got a program funded to go work under ice in uh, Antarctica. Sorry, in the Arctic, what am I saying? In the Arctic. And uh, there, the problem is this. The, um, the Arctic Ocean is kind of unique in the world because for 65 million years, it's been cut off from the rest of the world, okay? Because of the geology. And so, um, one thing that happened just prior to 2007, in 2005, there was an expedition there and they found, most geologists said that there's, no, there's gonna be no hydrothermal vent activity in, in the Arctic. And when they went there, they found more hydrothermal signatures than they have seen anywhere else on Earth. Now, the significance of that is that, you know, hydrothermal vents, some people argue, is where life started on this planet. So, it's, um, you know, if you can think of a nice science experiment, this is a really cool science experiment. Take the very basis of life, uh, put it in an isolation chamber for 65 million years, and see what comes of it. Okay, if you think about Australia, the reason marsupials and the flora flora of Australia is so different from the rest of the world is Australia as a continent evolved very independently for several tens of millions of years. And now you're going to do that with the very basis of life. So there was a little bit of a push to see who could go there first and try and find those hydrothermal vents and try and actually sample them. Okay? And because it's ice, we had to use autonomous underwater vehicles. Now, autonomous underwater vehicles, there's three kinds of vehicles that work underwater. There's manned submersibles. Alvin is a great example. If you looked at my screen before, there's a picture of Alvin. Uh, then there's ROVs, which are vehicles with a tether going to them. It's like a toy on a string. And then the most interesting ones are uh, autonomous underwater vehicles. Now, what's cool about autonomous underwater vehicles, and now, you know, here I am at the Robotics Institute. Um, does anybody know the first law of robotics? <laughs> Nothing works. Nothing works? <laughs> uh, you know, uh, because we are at RI, the first law of robotics, as the way I'm defining it, is that um, the number of deployments should equal the number of recoveries. Okay? <laughs> if that isn't true, you're going to be having a really bad day. Okay? So that's the first law of robotics. Now, there's a second law of robotics, and remind me to tell you what it is in a, in a little bit. Um, but anyway, here's what was going on under ICE before we came to the scene. There were two, uh, two groups. Uh, ISC, International Submarine Engineering in Canada. Uh, this is their robot. It costs $15 million to scale. You can see what a human being looks like in that context. This is Autosub. It's run out of the National Oceanography Center in the UK. It's roughly the same cost. And so they had this philosophy that they were going to use, you know, it's a very hard environment to work in. We're going to put lots of money in there, and that's what we're going to do with it. In contrast to them, uh, we built this robot. It was, uh, we didn't sacrifice anything in terms of quality, but it was about half a million dollars. And you know, our big deal was we were worried about the first law of robotics. And we were like, look, it's really hard. And we went to our program manager and said, we're gonna, you know, are you sure you want us to do this? We're going to lose a robot. They said, build two. OK, so we built two. And I said, uh, what's going to happen if we lose a robot? And they said, you'll have a second one. I said, what happens if I lose my second robot? They said, you better not lose both robots before you collect some data. Okay? And so, no pressure. Okay? And, and the other big difference between how we use these robots and how the commercial companies use them is our attitude was we're going to go uh, in the middle of ice, make a hole, drop a robot, 
Uh, this part of the ocean is actually some of the deepest parts of the ocean. It's at 4,100 meters. Okay, when we were deploying in 2007, nobody had taken an AUV to 4,100 meters ever. And we were doing it under, uh, under ice. So the idea was you open a hole in the ocean, you drop a robot, it goes down 4,100 meters, it does a search for hydrothermal vents, starts coming up. Now there's another complicating factor, which is this sea ice you see is moving. So over the course of 18 hours, that, that whole sea ice has moved about 10 kilometers. Okay, and our icebreaker has drifted 10 kilometers from where this robot is. So what we would do is we'd say, okay, robot's going down, it's done its mission, it's coming back up. A helicopter would take off from the icebreaker, go to where we were originally, try and find a hole in the ice, drive the icebreaker to that hole in the ice, then talk to that robot acoustically and get it to come up into that hole. What could go wrong? <laughs> okay, and on a good day, you know, here we are, we found a big hole, there's the robot. Um, and we did well. On a not so good day, here's what's going on. We, uh, we wound up at a spot where the ice was not happy with us and it closed out around us. We knew the robot was close by. If we brought it up to the surface uh, under ice, multipath meant we would have lost it. And so, you know, we, it, it was kind of one of those funny things where, you know, the cook on the icebreaker says, I know you're looking for your robot. I'm like, yeah, it's right there. It's right on the kitchen. I heard it. <laughs> okay. And, you know, there's multi parts, so we don't know where it is. We brought it up, and we were lucky that we could see it between two pieces of ice floor. And, you know, and we got it back. The recovery in this case took about a couple of hours. The total remission was 22 hours. We were a little worried at the end because we were running out of battery, and that's why we brought it up. If we had uh, waited another hour, I w we wanted to wait as long to see if it would open up, but then there was a call like, okay, let's get it up. Okay, so that's, that's that guy. And then um, what did we find? Um, it turns out um, you know, it was actually worth it. I apologize, that's in black. Um, there was a nature paper on explosive volcanism on the seafloor at 4,100 meters. Basically, uh, previous to when we went there, uh, people thought that if you had a volcano at 4,100 meters and it blew its top, the water pressure was so much that it could not exp um, uh, expo um, send stuff flying out into the water column because there's too much water pressure at 4,100 meters. After we saw this, we realized by sampling the stuff that, oh yeah, you can have so much pressure built up in a volcano that even when it blows its top off, even at 4,100 meters, it's gonna do this. Okay, and what's really interesting about this, this is 2007, when you think you're all on top of everything. We had picked up this volcanic eruption on the seismic network, but people had misinterpreted it as, a, as an earthquake, not as a volcanic eruption. So there are some interesting things going on even today that we are not aware of. Uh, hydrothermal vents, we never found the hydrothermal vents. They're still looking for them. What we did find is these microbial mats. And uh, what was really cool about them is we sampled them with a towed vehicle and we found 13 new species, actually 16 new species that were very high up on the family tree of life that nobody had found before and that was kind of cool too. So, you know, so that's the kind of thing we were doing. But now what happened is, here, here's a robot just to give you a sense of what's going on. It's, uh, it's got a big pressure housing right here. It's rated to 5,000 meters. It's got lots of batteries. It's got about a six kilowatt hour battery pack. And then it's got multiple thrusters. And if you look at most AUVs, they're torpedo shaped. And the reason they're torpedo shaped is they're trying to minimize drag as they go through the water. Now, people like me are really interested in working in, um, on imaging and working very close to the seafloor. So uh, typically we often work in areas where if you were trying to walk in that area, you'd need rock climbing gear. You know, there's steep cliffs and stuff like that, and we want our robots to follow along and be close to the seafloor while we're doing that. And so that's why it's got this kind of funky design. It's, if you think of torpedo jets, uh, torpedoes as jet aircraft, this is a helicopter. So we're more interested in designing helicopters than we are in designing jets. Okay, and uh, after we came back, uh, here's another, you know, 
Um, after we came back, actually, I'm going to stop this for one second. After we came back, we were at a conference, and um, I met this person who is now my good friend, Jeremy Wilkinson. And Jeremy said he was from the British Antarctic Survey. And he said, Hanu, we love the fact that you guys went on a rise. Can you come and do a mission for us? And I said, Jeremy, you're from the British Antarctic Survey. You guys have Autosub. We're a small group compared to you guys. Why don't you use Autosub? And he said, oh, I asked them. They said it's too risky. <laughs> okay, and I said, oh, great, thanks. Okay, that's, that sounds really, really good. And, uh, and this is when I tell you about the second law of robotics. Okay, the first law of robotics says number of uh, deployments should equal the number of recoveries. The second law of robotics says if you always follow the first law of robotics, you're not pushing the envelope. Okay, so the reason we don't name our uh, robots, it's, that's an AUV. You know, it's called Seabed because the guy who paid for it, wanted to call it seabed. It's not called blah, 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 blah. It's like my watch or my iPhone. I'm not going to name my iPhone. Maybe somebody does, but it's a piece of equipment. If we lose it, so be it. I don't care, OK? We want to get the science out of it. And so the second law of robotics says, if you always follow the first law, you're not pushing the envelope hard enough. OK, so that's, that's where we are. So now here we are. Uh, we talked to Jeremy. Jeremy said, let's go do sea ice. And uh, the uh, auto sub guys don't want to do it. And I said, OK, so we're the suckers. And he says, yeah. And he said, oh, we have one other constraint. I said, what is that? And he said, you can only charge us what auto sub would have charged us as an interdepartmental group. And I said, how much would they charge you? And he told me. And I said, oh, yeah, great. We'll do that. We can build a vehicle for that much money. OK, <laughs> so, so you, oops, let's go back. OK, so this is, um, you know, this is actually a different cruise. Uh, this is with the Australians, which came later, but it gives you a sense of what we do. So here are um, my grad student and postdoc, Clay Coons, Peter Kimball, and they are um, drilling a hole in the ice to put a navigation beacon in. They're going to survey that in, and then we're going to go deploy the vehicle under ice to measure what's underneath it. Okay? So let's just watch this for a second. And because we were shallow, in this case, we were just looking at the underside of sea ice, we could put a GoPro on our, on our vehicle. And so this is the view you'll see from the GoPro. And there was a little ROV in there, too, a little vehicle that was, just happened to be working. And you'll see in a second what that did for us. But this vehicle is completely autonomous. The other thing we had to do is we had to take all our sensors, which are looking, usually looking down, and make them looking up. And that makes for some interesting dynamics. So uh, this is from the GoPro on the, uh, usually we don't get imagery because we're so deep. This is a GoPro which is actually on this vehicle. And, uh, and so that's what you're seeing. And in a second, you'll see something else which was taken by that little ROV that you happen to see in the water. And so this is the money shot. It's appeared in every single magazine, it's still out of this. And we just, it was just luck, you know, it was, uh, it was actually kind of nice. And it just gives you a sense of what it's really like. It's a hole in the eyes. You drop your vehicle in, and, and that's what it's supposed to do. A couple of other things, if you're a dynamics person, to notice is these propellers are moving very slowly. And the reason they're moving very slowly is because they're very efficient. We want, you know, we want to really push the limits on endurance. So if you have an ROV, the props are going to move very fast, but they have infinite power. We're trying to uh, maximize our endurance, so that's why these are designed that way. OK, so this goes on for a little bit. Um, what did we get? We got the first few maps of the underside of sea ice. And uh, you know, I actually like this. This is the raw data. Because what you can see is one of the big problems with sea ice is it's moving. And um, you know, we actually use Michael Case's uh, ISAM algorithms. Uh, Clay did that for his uh, PhD. He modified ISAM to work on this data. And the idea is um, the problem with sea ice is it's moving. And so in, in SLAM, we make an assumption that Everything is, uh, yeah, they may be dynamic objects, but our features are not moving. Okay? So a person walking through a field is noise, and we don't care about that. The walls don't move. Here we've got uh, a terrain which is actually slowly moving over time. 
and, and, and you have to compensate for that. And one way of doing it is to say, look, we can make an assumption that in small periods of time, nothing has moved, and so we can make small submaps which are consistent, and then we can try and map them over time. And uh, in this case, we also had uh, multiple GPSs on the sea ice, so we can get an estimate of what the translation and rotation is, and we have ground truth to compare against, and that gives us a good sense that we're actually doing a good job. Okay? And this, again, what, you know, we did this with the Brits, we did it with the Australians. What's interesting about this from a high-level perspective is that in the Arctic, we all see these movies of the Arctic uh, or, you know, ice slowly decreasing, going to minima in the summer, in the, uh, in the Arctic summer. In the Antarctic, um, sea ice is actually increasing, okay? And there's a very good explanation for it. But when we were doing this, that explanation wasn't as well known. And there were lots of hypotheses. One of the hypotheses was that, oh, look, the area may be increasing, but the thickness is decreasing, so the overall volume is going down. Okay? And of course, the global uh, climate deniers are loving this. They're saying, oh, see, Antarctica, the sea ice is inc increasing. It's not. And when we went out there and made these measurements, lo and behold, we found that the sea ice was way thicker than we'd ever imagined. Okay? The old way of making measurements was literally they would take a drill, drill a hole, and then uh, you know, put a, a lead, I'm not making this up, put a lead line down and see, okay, this is 1.2 meters. Okay? But what would happen is they would never even try and drill the ridges which were five meters deep. They said, hey, we can't do that. So they were biasing their measurements by drilling in shallow water spots. So this, uh, this methodology completely uh, was really, really well received. So this is another nature paper. And then, of course, science can be complicated. We got lots of press for all this. But you know, this was my favorite headline. Penguin-powered robot finds Antarctic sea ice is thicker than first thought. I don't know, where did they get that from? <laughs> okay. Okay, and then uh, here's another one. I'm going to just go over this a little faster. Uh, one point we'd love to make is all these people come to me and say, oh, I know we want to use your AUV. And I'm like, okay, what's your application? And they say, well, we want to use it for looking at the seafloor. I'm like, what's the seafloor look like? Well, it's flat. If it's flat, don't use an AUV. Use a towed vehicle, okay? There are certain reasons to use an AUV, but if you can do something with a boat, do it with a boat. If you can do something with a simpler technology, don't just be religious about your technology. Okay, there's lots of ways of solving the problem. And in this case, they just, they said, you know, one of the interesting things that's happened about the Western Antarctic Peninsula is that nobody knows what's going on. Waters are warming. We think these invasive species are coming in, like crabs, and the native fauna are completely defenseless against these crabs, and we want to know what they are. And so we went out, and this is one of the first times I've been on an expedition where it was, it was about 35 days, where by the end of the expedition, they had written up a paper, submitted it, and got it accepted. <laughs> okay, that blows me away. And, and the reason is nobody had done anything in, in the Western Antarctic Peninsula. You know, we think about space, there's so many parts of our planet where we just don't know what's going on, okay? We know that whales go to Antarctica. We know whale falls are very important. Nobody would seen a whale fall in Antarctica. We saw the first one, and they said, that's a paper, okay? Uh, we looked at all this imagery, and they said, oh. And I said, what are you going to do with it? She said, oh, I'm, all I'm going to do is describe all the fish we saw. That was another paper. <laughs> I'm like, okay, man, I want to move into an area where nobody's working. <laughs> okay. And, you know, and then, yeah, but it was really good work. You know, this was a science um, perspective on climate change and how it's affecting invasive species. And our little expedition was where, sorry, I don't have a, uh, was these crabs right here, okay? That was us. We could prove that this invasive species is moving into Antarctica. Okay, so now I'm going to switch gears on you, okay? I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, fisheries research. And I had a student. Uh, he has now gone down the black hole of Google X, and I don't know what he does anymore, even though he's a good friend of mine and talks to me quite a bit. I told him this is what his thesis should be. One fish, two fish, red fish, blue fish. We get all this data, and what the fisheries, you know, 10 years ago, no, I used to say 10 years, 15 years ago, um, the fisheries managers did not have enough imagery of the seafloor, okay? And then when we started using these vehicles, we started getting so much imagery that they got swamped with it, you know? First they would say, they would go out and say, oh, we want a couple of hundred images. We'd get them 10,000. And then, oh, this is fantastic. This is the best imagery we've ever seen. I'm like, OK, what are you going to do with it? Well, uh, over the next six months, we can analyze 200 of them. The rest of them, we're going to put on the shelf. And you're like, come on, OK? And this was before machine learning. So we were very interested in saying, OK, can we count all the fish? Can we classify them to the species level? And I'm going to take a slight detour here and talk about imaging underwater. 
One of the big problems with imaging and basically anything you do underwater is that electromagnetic radiation gets attenuated very, very fast. Okay, so no Wi-Fi, no GPS, no RF at all, and images, if you're, uh, you know, even a couple of meters away, they all look green or blue, depending upon what you're doing. And the reason is the reds are getting attenuated way faster than the greens and the blues. Okay, and you know, so one of the things I do is I build cameras, and uh, we learned that this is very similar to microscopic imaging where we're not limited by resolution, we're limited by our dynamic range. So we made a big choice and said, we are gonna get microscope cameras, we're gonna use real 14-bit cameras, because then when we amplify the reds, we have enough signal-to-noise ratio that we can actually get real imagery. Okay, and that, that's, so what I'm gonna show you from now onwards is all imagery that's been corrected like this. Okay, and this imagery is better than 95 or 99% of the imagery you'll ever see for underwater stuff because we're ahead of that. So, you know, here's imagery from different parts of the world, coral reefs, uh, untrollable habitats. And of course, nowadays, SSD, YOLO, you pick yours and we can actually do reasonably well. But here's, um, here's an interesting experiment that just concluded last year. So fish are a little bit like people when they see a television camera. So here's what happens. Television camera shows up. And uh, one of two or three things happen, you know. Television camera, either people come running and go, oh, television camera, I want to be on TV. Or television camera, oh, God, I'm going to get away from television camera, okay. Or television camera, fine, they, they come to see me all the time and you walk away, okay. So there's three different behaviors. And these behaviors tend to cause biases to happen. So we call them avoidance, attraction, and then they're unbiased. And if you have avoidance and you look at, count the fish in your imagery, then what you'll see is that you're overcounting. If you have, um, sorry, if you have avoidance, then you're, sorry, undercounting. If you have attraction, you're overcounting. And we want to figure that out, and nobody really knows what that was, right? In fact, uh, in the early 90s, the first time somebody put an AUE, it wasn't us, uh, in the water, they got pictures of fish, and they wrote a science paper uh, saying, we can now count fish by using AUVs on the seafloor but they didn't count for uh, avoidance or attraction. Okay, so we designed this experiment with NOAA where they put these very small camera cages on the seafloor and then we ran our robots by them. We waited for the fish to habituate on these and then we said, look, you know, can we count how many fish we see in this camera and then we'll count the fish we see when we, the robot uh, sees and, and we'll try and see what goes on. And the answer, unfortunately, is very complicated. Uh, avoidance and attraction is a function of species. It's a function of all sorts of different things. And we're slowly trying to get to the bottom of it. But I want to show you a snippet of data. Okay, just watch this. Okay, question for you. Uh, show of hands. How many people, and I'll, I'll play this again. How many people thought that um, the fish were avoiding that toe cam? Okay, how many thought they, it was not? Okay, I'm gonna play it again, and then we will, I have that poll one more time. Oh, come on. Oh, sorry. Uh, okay. Okay, I personally looked at that and said, oh yeah, that's avoidance. And the fisheries biologists all conferred amongst themselves that no, that's not avoidance. So who knows? Okay, so it's still a complicated question. All right, um, this is my cue now to show you something completely different. Okay, so one of the big problems we have is uh, fisheries has been around for uh, 150 years, and we have a bunch of field guides. I don't know if you were, you know, a naturalist when you were growing up. Uh, you know, you get a field guide. It has all the flowers, all the birds, and stuff like that, and they are fantastic. And nowadays, you can get these. These are apps. So this is Bird Snap out of Cornell, where you can figure out what bird it is. And because they have a beautiful recording of pretty much every bird, you can uh, find out what its size is, whether it's sitting on the bottom, whether it's sitting on the bottom, and quickly figure out which one it is. And it'll play the sound for you, too. OK? So that's Bird Snap. There's Leaf Snap. And Leaf Snap is actually kind of cool, where they say, hey, you want to identify which kind of tree it is? You can break a leaf off. You can, and it's very 2D. Take a picture with your camera. And by looking at it and looking at a GPS, we can tell you roughly what, your, what tree it is. Okay? So those are kind of cool. And now uh, we had this person right here, Amy. She has no background in computer science, no background in engineering. 
she was an art major. And one of the things she was, she was from Aberdeen. And she's very community minded, civic minded. She went into the inner cities in Aberdeen and she said, you know, I was talking about fish and I was getting blank, blank uh, stares all around. And she said, I suddenly realized out of the 40 kids in that inner city school, pretty much all of them, none of them, even though they lived on, the, on a port town, none of them had really seen a fish before. Okay? So she said, she made it her deal that she was going to um, try and give them a sense of what a fish really looks like. Okay? Come on. Okay, so I'm going to just very quickly uh, show you part of her presentation. Okay, I met her at a conference. Uh, she came down, worked in our lab for a bit, and uh, here's some of the things she did. Okay, so here's the traditional method of a fish. You know, you have a, a beautiful drawing. You've caught the fish, you put it on the table, and now the problem is we want to actually identify these fish without catching them. You know, we're running out of fish to catch. How do you identify these fish when you see them from different angles? And here's one way you can do it. You can go and get CD scans of all your fish. Problem is, a CD scanner is expensive. You can't take it out. Okay. And so here's what Amy did. Okay. She took she took this fish. And lo and behold, she has a complete 3D scan of it. And what did she do? Again, she has no computer science background. Okay. She took her phone camera and went click 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 click. Click, 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 3D uh, structure from motion, uh, stuff that she's downloaded from the web, which she absolutely doesn't understand, and she can do this fantastic stuff. Okay? And it gets better, right? So she buys a fish from the market. This happens to be um, trout. Now you can look at it from any angle you want. Okay? And you can even do things like this. Uh, one more. Come on. Hello? Okay. And then she uh, got really fancy. If there's very low contrast, she would place stuff on it, she'd go out on the fishing boats, take a trash can and a lighting and do all this in, you know, um, true hacking. And so here's, uh, here's some examples of what she got. Because she was hanging it from different threads, she had to filter those out, but she's still doing a great job. But then she said, you know, one of the interesting things is that hand drawings really show us detail. Now she's an artist and she said, what I'm going to do now is do the 3D structure for motion and I'm going to texture map the hand-drawn stuff. And so that's what she did here. And so now you get the best of both worlds. You get the 3D as well as the texture. And then, of course, you know, you want to do a dissection? All right, let's do a dissection for you, OK? You can dissect it and virtually look at it as well. OK, so, and you can 3D print it. OK, so. <laughs> So this was really kind of cool. Uh, it came out uh, way out of left field, and we loved it. Uh, Noah loved it. There's an app in the making. It should be released in a month, where we've uh, scanned, uh, I think it's like 150 fish now. And it's going to run on your iPad, and, and we've updated how we do that. OK, so now uh, here's uh, uh, one other issue with, uh, with fishery stuff. You get all these images. You color correct the living daylights out of them. And you still have a problem counting them. So can any of you see the uh, skate in here? You can see the skate, right? Right there in the center. Yeah. All right. Um, question number two, can you see the second state? There's two skates in there. Uh, do you have a pointer somewhere? I'm going to need a pointer. Anyone got a pointer? Huh? It's right above. You can actually see its outline. It's better in there. But this is the easy example. I'm going to show you another. Anyone got a pointer that I can borrow? Oh, thanks. OK, so while he's finding me a pointer, I should have one. I don't, but that's OK. I'm going to show you a video, OK? This one's called Wow, so it better be good, OK? So with uh, that kind of hype, let's watch something. You don't have a pointer. OK, that's all right. Oh, sorry. I should be hitting play here. OK, so here we go. So that's an octopus, OK? And we're going to play this back in slow motion so you can see it again, OK? And now it's become really big. It was hiding there because it was looking for prey. Now it thinks it's prey, so it's like, don't mess with me. I'm really big, OK? So now I'll watch it in slow motion reverse.
Okay, so, oh, thank you so much, uh, Michael. Okay, so, you know, how does this work? Just press it? Yeah. All right, so now, you know, I love to collect hard problems, and there's a reason I like to collect hard problems. Um, you know, A, they, uh, you know, keep me up at night, and B, it forces me to collaborate with people that I would not normally collaborate with. So I used to go around and show this problem to lots of people, and there's two parts to this problem, and I'm not showing you the other part. One part is, how do you find things? How do you do the analysis problem? And then the other is synthesis, okay? So what's interesting about the octopus is that it's colorblind, okay? So it's hiding itself, and here's some more examples. There's octopuses in each of these images, and we're gonna talk about them in a second. And how does it do such a good job? Okay, and then I met Bill Freeman and I was showing him this and I said, Bill, you are the texture mapping guru of the world. Um, there's an interesting synthesis problem. Everybody does a texture synthesis, but they assume they have an infinite color palette and they don't think about 3D. Can we do texture synthesis for camouflage where we are independent of viewpoints? And Bill and his group did a really good job of that, okay? But the analysis problem was you know, more my style and I was like trying to figure this out. So let's do the following. So I thought of this as one of those unsolvable problems. Can you see the octopus? I'm gonna show you the octopus in the first image. Okay, it's right here. You can see it's two eyes and it's arms right here, okay? Anybody see the octopus in the second image, which is this one right here? You can see it's eye right here, okay? And there it is, okay. This is me being nice to you guys. Okay, now, find me the octopus in the third image and the fourth image. And because Marshall is uh, not paying attention to me, I'm gonna pick on him. Marshall, where's the... <laughs> I'm just kidding, Marshall. For those of you who don't know, when I was a grad student, I hosted Marshall and uh, uh, back in Woods Hole, how many years ago was that? Oh, I'm 22. <laughs> 90s. 90s, yes, exactly. Before you were born, most of you, unfortunately. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so anyone see the octopus in the third image? So Darshan, do you see it? No. Paloma, do you see it? Maligadani, do you see it? Okay, I'll show it to you, okay? Come on, and after this, you guys better do better, okay? Here it is, you can see its arms, and you can see its eyes sitting right there, okay? <laughs> all right, final exam. You guys are all at Carnegie Mellon, so you're all aggressive about your grades. You're all gonna fail if you don't tell me what it is in here. Towards the right, where? Middle right, uh, so this is right, middle right, uh, no, not really. So I'll, I'll tell you, that's the null case. There's no octopus in there, <laughs> okay? And that's part of the problem. If you know that it's there and you spend enough time looking at it, you might be able to find it. But 99.9% .9 of the time, it's not there and then you can easily gloss over. Now, like I said, I thought this was an impossible problem, and you know, the skate problem, I thought we'd make some progress on that. We can kind of sort of see something. Okay, it turns out we, I met this one person, Lakshman Prashad, and I showed him this, he was really psyched, and he said he was down at Woods Hole for a week. He said, you know, I'm just gonna spend some time on this. I'm like, okay. So here's what he did. He could, um, all those octopus you see, he could find all of them, automatically, okay? And uh, here's the example we're gonna use. Here's the octopus. You can see its arms, its eyes, it's right there in the center so you can see it easily. But again, this algorithm works across the board, okay? So here it is, and he does a really good job of segmentation, okay? He's doing both spatial and frequency, um, and he's playing some games, but you know, this doesn't solve the problem. It does segment out the, the octopus, kind of, but you still don't know which segment it is in, okay? And then he does magic, and lo and behold, Here's your octopus, okay? He's got a lot of false positives along the side. They're easy to filter out, but I've left them in. So here it is again, just so you can see it, right there. And if I go down, here it is. And all sorts of false positives which you can filter out. Any guesses on what he did? Super pixels. Was that super pixels? No, oh, sorry. Uh, that wasn't it. Yeah? I was curious if you get anything out of other spectra. Just so, you know, people can, uh, so you can look at different apart, uh, you know, uh, hyperspectral images, and you might see certain things uh, pop out, but we're really interested in this problem, which is, you know, here it is. It's you're given RGB, and that's all there is to it. And, you know, there's one other interesting issue. That if you look at the octopus, what I love about it, and I, in this case, I happen to know it's a male, okay, for various reasons, okay? Um, what I love about it is it's not matching to the background. It looks like, you know, it, it can change its skin tone. It looks like it uh, understands the texture of all the things that are in the environment. 
and figures out the texture it can put on to hide itself. It's not blending like the skate was. So I'll tell you what happened. Okay? Uh, uh, what Lakshman figured out is he said all living beings try to conserve energy. And if you look at the perimeter, it's way smoother than uh, other things. And that's why you're getting all these false positives, because you've got straight line edges. And that's what makes these things completely pop out. Okay? Hack, but still, it was kind of interesting. OK, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to move on. I'm going to move on. I'm going to talk a little bit about a surface vehicle. Um, there's lots and lots of surface vehicles that exist. Um, I didn't want to build one until, um, you know, for various reasons. And then uh, we saw an application. And, and here's the problem with surface vehicles. You can build big ones, which cost a million bucks. Uh, but if you build small ones, um, the problem is electric motors are only so efficient. And the small ones, you need to use them in coastal areas. And in coastal areas, you have these currents. And so it's very hard to build a small unmanned surface vehicle that can handle the coastal currents that exist in, uh, in uh, you know, say, around Woods Hole. We have Woods Hole Passage. The current is eight knots. Designing a small vehicle on an electric motor that can do eight knots and last for at least a tidal cycle, at least six hours, impossible job. Okay? And then we found uh, this company which was building uh, these kayaks, and they have a little gasoline engine on them. They take a Subaru lawnmower engine and they pop it in there. Okay? And it's not uh, seaworthy, uh, you know, seawater will destroy it. It's meant for uh, uh, fresh water only. But as soon as we saw that, we were like, oh, great, this is perfect. So, and unlike underwater, we can use standard drone stuff, you know, spectrum receivers. Um, a remote control. And very, very quickly, we can build something that can, in this case, it can last for 100 kilometers. It can, uh, while going at uh, 10 knots, which is 5 meters per second. Okay? And our application, uh, we had uh, this uh, scientist, and uh, she's, she's very interested in glaciology. And so it's hard to give you a sense of scale, but uh, this glacier is 130 meters tall which is five or six times the size of this building in height, okay? So it's a big glacier. It's 10 kilometers across, and it's considered small by Greenland standards, but it's pretty impressive, okay? And what they were very interested in doing is making measurements right here at the edge of this glacier. And the problem with that is big chunks of ice, like this one which is sitting here, tend to fall off. And you don't want to be anywhere in the vicinity when that big chunk of ice falls off. So we said, let's build a robot uh, if you look at our AUVs, we don't want to lose them very often. We have lost one, and uh, we'll probably lose another one one of these years. But you know, that's a lot of money. These are only $40,000. And so, yeah, let's just build one. If a big chunk of ice falls on it, so be it, as long as we can get some data. And so we wound up getting, I, this was a few years ago. I actually just came back from another trip. I don't have that data to sh show you just yet, but this has been a spectacular success. And there's a great story here. This is a picture taken from a helicopter. Um, we were camped over here, and we would go out daily to the glacier in front of it and make these measurements. And when you're in the middle of nowhere in Greenland, your lifeline is the helicopter pilot. If something happens to you, you, know, you break a leg or something like that, the helicopter pilot is going to get into the helicopter and try and get you a rescue. So they are uh, mama-san, OK? They really care about you, but they're also, you know, they also give you a safety briefing. So the helicopter pilot was coming across, and this is a picture taken on the helicopter. And he gets on the radio, and he's like, oh, there's someone on a, in a kayak really close to the glacier. Get out of there right now. And we're like, no, 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 there's nobody out there. He's like, I can see it. It's right there. And we're like, no. And this is on a radio with all sorts of static. And we're like, no, 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 there's nobody there. It's OK. There's nobody near the glacier. And he lands, and he's furious. And he comes out, and he's like, I saw it, and we're like, no, this is what it was. And his face and jaw dropped. We're like, oh, that's kind of cool. Okay. <laughs> and so it's, it's uh, kind of neat to see stuff like that. Here's, um, I'm trying to wind down quickly. Here's a couple of other things we've done. Uh, we went out, uh, and um, one of my students took a DJI drone, nothing fancy, but we learned lots of lessons about working at minus 40 degrees Celsius. Okay. One of the lessons you learn about minus 40 degrees Celsius is that if your batteries freeze over, you're done. Okay. And so what he would do is he would wear lots of warm clothes. And uh, Thomas is Thomas. He would take all the batteries and warm them up with his skin. So he had a battery pack of lithium ion <laughs> that he would strap around his skin. And then what happens is as soon as you plug it into the DJI, you have to turn it on within a minute. Because what happens when you turn it on, there's enough internal resistance that it self heats and, and it can operate in, in a reasonable way. But if you don't turn it on in a couple of minutes, it's going to die on you. So there were just these additional constraints. Uh, what did we find? 
uh, I don't know if you saw this in the news, it came out like a year ago. Uh, we found uh, a very large penguin colony, 1.5 million penguins, which people that did not know about before. Okay, and, uh, and that was a huge big surprise. And so, yeah. Well, so actually, I'm glad you asked. Okay, so there's um, so right now we're um, right now I can give you a blog spot. I have another group of collaborators who are in Antarctica looking at another penguin colony. So if you look at Landsat images, you can't see individual penguins. What you can see is in one channel you can see what people call penguin poo. Okay, so from Landsat you have penguin poo as a marker for where the penguin colonies are. Okay, and then uh, but you still have to go and see how big they are. So this one person said, I'm going to look at, you know, we know that these colonies are really well studied. I'm going to look at Landsat imagery on the Western Antarctic Peninsula and try and find what I think are large colonies that people haven't uh, really studied. And they identified three or four, um, you know, characteristics and said, all right, let's go mount an expedition there. And now this space, we actually knew there was a penguin colony, but most people thought that this was very small. It was like 5,000 penguins. When they actually went out and did the count and said, you know, 1.5 million. That's what blew people away. So that's why that penguin poo from space came from. And then here's another story for, you know, I have an um, ongoing challenge with all my students. I say, whenever you give a talk, if you can give a talk without using the word machine learning, I give you, uh, you know, a coupon to Amazon. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and so having said that, you know, there are certain things machine learning is good for. Okay. And um, those 1.5 million penguins, uh, the group, Heather Lynch and Stephanie Genouvrier, who were the biologists, they had three grad students, and five of them, each one of them, hand counted 1.5 million penguins. Okay? It took them six months. If I had to do that, I would slit my wrists. Okay? And so, um, you know, our student, Thomas, and I said, Thomas, what are they doing? He said, oh, I made very nice 3D uh, structure for motion mosaics for them. And he said, they're projecting them on the wall, and they take a yellow marker and say, penguin, penguin, penguin. And then they slide it over. And I'm like, Thomas. And he says, you know what? And he said, I offered to just run a simple TensorFlow machine learning thing. Uh, it's very easy to segment them. They're black against the background. And he says, they said, they said, no, our peer review says we have to hand count them. And he said, all right. And he said, if you're going to hand count them, uh, that means I have beautiful ground truth. I want to do some machine learning. So he said, let them hand count them. Turns out amongst the five of them, there was an error rate of about plus minus 3%. And then when he ran his uh, machine learning algorithms, he was well within the bounds of, of all of them. Okay? And so, hey, what can I say? Okay, um, I have about 10 minutes left, so I'm going to talk about a couple of topics which very, very quickly okay, that I'm interested in. Uh, since I moved from Woods Hall, one of the reasons to move was I wanted to work more on both aerial vehicles and uh, in non-marine environments. And uh, one thing I was always very excited about was light fields. And so for those of you who don't know what light fields are, uh, you know, Mark Lavoie, Pat Hanran came up with this concept where they said if we have an n-dimensional array of cameras and we can trace all the rays over a particular volume, then we can reconstruct the scene from pretty much any angle or any viewpoint. And it had some very strong implications for computer graphics. Okay? And you know, the classic, if you haven't seen this, go look it up. Um, the classic example is then you can refocus along any plane. And the classic example that uh, Mark Lavoie would show is he'd show a Stanford scene with a hedge, okay, and, and then he would slowly refocus. And, uh, as he, and you, know, you look at the hedge, there's nothing there, right? It's a hedge. And then enough rays were coming through that he could refocus past the hedge. And then, you know, this was a DAPA program, you would see somebody, not in very high resolution, walk up there, turn around and point a gun at, uh, at the viewer, okay? So you could do things with very, very little data, okay? Because you had, uh, and the big problem with it is, and this was literally 10 years ago, is that you needed a large array, okay? And so some of the arrays they were using had 128 cameras. You also needed lots of computation time. And so we had a student, um, Abhishek Bajpai, who was working with Professor Teche. They're very interested in fluid flows, where they're looking at three-dimensional fluid flows. And they decided they would use light fields in, uh, for visualizing PIV. And, and the big issue is um, Abhishek is an amazing GPU programmer. And so he took all their cords, and he made them so that he could run them at 30, 40 hertz, because th those are the kinds of things that they were interested in. And then, you know, 
Uh, we had this conversation, and, and Alex says, God, what do I do with a student? He's doing such great work, but he doesn't want to graduate. He wants some flashy thing. I'm like, great, I have a great flashy thing. Let's take these light fields, and let's run them on autonomous cars. Okay? And Abhishek was all over that. And he said, you know, one of the interesting issues with autonomous cars, most of them have an array of about six, seven, maybe 10 cameras on them already. Okay? And so if you've got that array, you don't need any more hardware. And the beauty of his techniques is he really pushed the computation. And he, um, he pointed out a few things. We don't need a 2D array for all applications. We are not computer graphics people. We don't want to completely uh, get uh, viewpoint independence. We're happy to just get refocusing in certain, uh, certain dimensions. And for that, a 1D array is good enough. And then he made some very nice calculations so that he doesn't have to calculate the entire light field. He calculates on the fly what he really needs to do. And so as long as he has an arbitrary manifold that you def define, he can reproject on that. And what, he, uh, what we found out is with a reasonable computer with maybe a couple of GPUs in it, we can do that at 20 to 30 hertz. Okay? And so that was huge. And uh, you know, I'll show you some examples. But the first time we took it out on our autonomous car, um, we were driving in Boston. And for those of you who've never been to Boston, Boston roads are like, you know, they're like, they've been bombed on. Okay? They're pretty bad. And we go over the first pothole, and our alignment goes out. A camera alignment goes out. We can actually detect that. But now suddenly our light field calculations are all off because we need good calibration. And he's like, well, we got 10 seconds of really good data. And I'm like, oh, no, no, that's not good enough. And so what he then worked on was he said, you know, the calibration is just, we can detect when it goes out of calibration. It's just slightly out of calib. And I can actually run algorithms to retune the calibration. I can't do that at 30 hertz. It takes about a second. But if we go out of calibration, we can take a second and recalibrate. And so that's been a really, really nice thing. And that's what he's showing here. We hit a bump. That was what that looked like, that ambulance. We recalibrate, and we are focusing just on this plane. That's why it's so, so well in focus, whereas everything else is not. And then there's some interesting issues this lets us do. OK, here's an example. And we've really tried to get the contrast out. You're light limited. And it doesn't matter what kind of registration you use. You can't, even if you take multiple images, unless you stop, you can't uh, get your signal to noise ratio up enough to look at this sign. And because you've got five cameras uh, looking at that particular sign, you can do a light field characteristic. And I don't know if you guys can see this, but I've seen it enough that I can say it reads, preferred decal holder parking only. OK, if you see it in its original, it, it actually does seem to work. So there's. Um, He's writing his final paper, which is why I'm not showing it to you. But um, the really cool application of this is looking through snow. Okay, when it's snowing, he can actually go through and uh, look through the snow and, and pick up uh, signposts and other things that are not there. Okay, and the last thing I want to show you is I'm a, I'm a field roboticist. Uh, we have um, uh, a person by the name of Robert Platt who does some very nice work in grasping. And most of the manipulation people have been working um, you know, Amazon picking channel, a challenge, right? There's a bunch of objects. How fast can you pick them? And we hack our ways around, and we say, oh, you know what? It's hard to pick. Let's just get a vacuum gripper. And so we don't have to solve the picking problem or the grasping problem. We're just going to vacuum up these objects and pop them one over the other. And that's fine. But um, I think two people, Ken Goldberg and Rob Platt, have really tried to push the grasping problem. So uh, what we wound up doing is saying, OK, Rob, let's go outside. And so here it is. It's a completely autonomous system. Uh, we've got SLAM running on it. There it is inside our garage. We have a SLAM map of this area, which is not very good. And we want to go pick up something. And so here's what's going on. Here's our SLAM map. And uh, you know, we point out where the objects are roughly. And, uh, and, they, uh, and then as you see, there's some interesting engineering concerns, right? That was uh, slip slide staring which doesn't work very well when you're trying to do autometry. So we put the back wheels on costers. <laughs> OK. Um, garbage can bags are actually very hard to pick up because they're low contrast. You don't know what the pick point is. And one of the things we did to Rob and his students is we filled the garbage bags differently. So some of them, they should be able to pick up with this UR5. But a lot of them were so heavy that if they tried to pick them up, they would rip them apart. OK. So this one they managed to pick up. They actually had some very good fun with the stuff that was heavy. And they liked it so much that they're writing a separate paper about it. <laughs> okay. So this just went out. Uh, this is under review at ICRA. And now you can see it goes right there. 
Um, everything is on board. That was the other rule we had. Nothing offline. No supercomputers in the back. And so we still need to optimize this code. We want it to work in real time. Uh, one of the other things that one of the students is working on is to say we shouldn't have to come to a stop. He wants to be able to you know, move, move past something, pick it up, and pop it in there, where, we aim, where he does the grasp detection and everything in, in real time. And so you know, a whole, whole variety of objects. They're using the Intel RealSense camera in there. And you know, one of the problems with that is uh, what happens? It works great indoors. What happens in, in broad sunlight? Okay? And it actually turns out it's not too bad. Uh, you know, we were thinking about mounting a little laser scanner instead of the RealSense. But it actually works reasonably well in even bright sunlight, which surprised us. And you know, uh, the classic problem with all these videos is they say, oh, here's typical data. And what that really means is the best data we ever got. <laughs> okay. But here's some interesting failure modes. Okay, wind. Okay. Things are moving. And here's a bad grasp. Okay. And gripping is an issue. That, those fingers are really actually pretty bad. And so, um, anyway, so that's, uh, that's that. I, I would like to end here by acknowledging that I'm just the guy who gives the talk. My grad students do all the work, and my collaborators give us interesting problems to work on. So I'd be happy to take any questions if you have any. Yeah? Um, in those systems that you showed going, <clears throat> Under the ice and looking for new bacteria. Yeah. I didn't see a sample collection. So this, uh, yeah, so the sample collection was actually done by a Toad platform, which was uh, separate, and that had a vacuum uh, suction on it. Originally, the plan was that it was a, a program with some other university, and they were going to put a manipulator on the vehicle. And uh, that was a huge constraint on our vehicle. We hit it. The manipulator kind of sort of worked, but they never got it out to sea. And we knew that was a hard problem. So we had gotten an insurance policy by building a towed vehicle with um, samplers on it. Because one of the interesting issues is it doesn't matter how good an image you take. If you're a biologist, they want to sample because they want to do DNA analysis. And that's, you know, they said image is not worth it. You know, a good image is good, but we need to do DNA. Yeah? So I think one of you know, several things, right? One of the uh, one of the big things, which is why I actually moved and I'm working with this, is that um, if you look at the three class of vehicles, and I haven't talked about the different vehicles, the manned submersibles actually, you know, the only reason they are there is they are similar to the space shuttle. You know, the people who go down want to be heroes or want to be perceived as heroes. Okay, so there's nothing an ROE can't do that a manned submersible can do. Okay, but that's if you say that in front of the manned submersible people, that's heresy. Okay, so, so that's one issue. Now, the remotely operated vehicles, they are very good at manipulation because you got a human in the loop. Okay, and it's very hard to do manipulation underwater with an AUV. And so I think that's one of the holy grails. Can we, you know, typically what we do is we'll do a mission, we'll find something that's interesting, we'll even have a picture of it. Our navigation is not that good, it's good to a couple of meters. But my scenario says, look, I found that object. I found that tube worm that we want to sample. I know where it is good to a couple of meters. I want to drive my AUV down there. And then when I'm in that locality, I'll find that tube worm and automatically sample it. And right now, I'd be happy to sample things that we call our sessile, as in not moving. You know, motile organisms are another whole issue, right? But can we do that? Another big issue, um, actually, I can show you. Uh, that we're working on, I wasn't going to talk about it, uh, is this one right here. Oh, come on. Okay, another big issue is we would love to get, um, we would love to get end effectors where we have haptic feedback across the whole night. So here's an example. Uh, I'm going to just, uh, this is a work by Peter Whitney. Uh, who's uh, one of our assistant scientists. And, uh, you know, and what's really cool is that right here, I mean, you can see the kind of feedback you get. Every time he taps it, you can look at the oscilloscope. You can really measure that. 
Okay? And if we can get that kind of haptic feedback to somebody who's operating a vehicle, that would make a huge difference. But the person operating the vehicle is on the ship, and you're, do you have a wire now? So some people have, uh, yeah. So there, like I said, there's two kinds of vehicles. There's remotely operated vehicles, which have a tether going all the way down. And they are the good ones for manipulation, but they still don't do a good job. They destroy half their samples because they are using hydraulic manipulators with no feedback whatsoever. So this would be one good way of doing that, is to say, look, now we have feedback, very good haptic feedback, and uh, we can pick up a tilapia and put it in a box without destroying the tilapia. Okay? And, so, and we can see the feedback of a fish catching so that we know when to close the gripper. Okay? So that's one problem. The other problem is, now can we take this kind of mechanism and put it on an AUV and do autonomous manipulation, which is what we were showing on land. So I think m merging field robots with manipulation is one of the holy grails that I'm very interested in. And Why was it so hard to plug in? Oh, I'll, I'll tell you. There's No, no. So if you look and search for the um, highest cited papers in the BP oil leak, uh, they will be Rich Camilli, uh, who was my postdoc. And, and, and there's a funny story there, which I don't know who I was telling that story to, uh, is, you know, a, a lot of our graduates wind up in the oil industry. So Rich was my postdoc, Vikrant Shah was my grad student, Vikrant went to BP, and they were very good friends. And Vikrant went to BP, and Rich is uh, the expert on, uh, um, on chemical sensing underwater. And when the oil uh, you know, blowout happened, Rich was called by the Coast Guard and the USGS to go and investigate. Vikrant was running the control room for BP. And Vikrant picks up the phone and says, oh, Rich is running this. I'm going to call Rich. And Rich says, I'm not picking the phone from anybody from BP. <laughs> okay. And so it's interesting to see both sides of it. And you know, all the oil companies, and I can say this out loud, they're hiding stuff. Okay. So here's a, here's a really good example of what really happens in the world. Okay, you're in a harbor, and somebody has a leak. Okay, they leak something toxic in the, uh, in the harbor. Guess what happens? Okay, suddenly all the other ships that are there say, and you know, people figure it out, or they uh, self-report, oh, we had a leak. Suddenly all the other ships that are there, they jettison all the environmentally hazardous stuff. Because they say, you can't tell the difference. This guy's already paying for it, I can get away with this. Okay, and so what happens is we need mass specs that are this small. And Rich developed a mass spec that was this small. And now, by looking at the different isotopic ratios, you can fingerprint where everything came from. So BP denied everything. So here's what we did. First, we measured the flow rate. They said, no, 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 this, this is wrong. Then we measured its extent. They said, there's all these naturally occurring seeps. And you're measuring the naturally occurring seeps. And we said, here's the mass spec um, fingerprint. This is your leak. Okay? And the extent was a, is going to be a function of the fine that they're going to face. Okay? And what did they do? Uh, I'm not going to get on this high horse. Okay. <laughs> but I've already started. Okay. So one of, the, one of the interesting issues is, just like the Robotics institution, uh, Robotics Institute, we're soft money. Okay? So on the one side, we want to do the best signs. On the other side, BP is our customer. A lot of alumni are there. So BP is giving Rich a really hard time. They decide to sue him individually for every single email they have, he has for the last 10 years, okay? because they say he was, uh, he was predisposed to be biased against BP. And he's like, I can't deal with this. Woods Hole has one lawyer. He can't deal with a BP team of lawyers. And it's a nightmare. Meanwhile, the administration invites a BP delegation to a technical seminar because they want the money. So there's all sorts of interesting things that happen. And the bottom line is, you know, accidents are going to happen. People are going to try and point fingers elsewhere. And, uh, you know, yeah. Whenever I teach robotics, the first thing I do is, uh, oh, God, I'm really uh, digressing now. The first thing I do is make everybody read uh, Richard Feynman's Appendix F, OK, on the space shuttle disaster. If you haven't read it, if you're a grad student, please go look it up and read it, OK? And the bottom line is, he talks about what are the, you know, he talks to the managers and says, what's the probability of failure of a space shuttle? And they have a number of 1 in 100,000. And he laughs his head off. He says, that means they could launch a space shuttle every day for 100 years, and they should not see a single failure. And then he goes and talks to the engineers, and they say, eh, probably 1 in 100. And he does the math, and he says, oh, yeah, we'll lose two shuttles over the course of X years. And, but why is there this disconnect? Because the managers just don't want to hear it. Okay, uh, the classic thing on, on the space shuttle, they said, oh, here's the tolerance. Oh, because we've had uh, no accident in the last um, three launches, we can change that our tolerance. <laughs> you know? So I think it's, 
you know, there's all sorts of issues which are non-engineering related, which are kind of fun to talk about and, uh, and deal with. All right, well, thank you, guys. I'm sorry? Yes, actually, uh, thank you, uh, Marshall. So one other thing uh, I want to show you very quickly is uh, where um, we are, uh, since I started uh, at Northeastern, um, since I started at Northeastern two and a half years ago, we're, uh, we've been given a charter to build a robotics program. And we've gone from two faculty to now eight faculty. Um, these are, uh, you know, there's some really, really interesting people here. And uh, we have a charter to expand to 15. So we're always hiring. Uh, so if you're a grad student or a postdoc looking for a job, please come talk to me. I'd be happy to talk to you. Uh, the great thing about hiring is I love talking to bright people. And I can give you advice on, and this is absolutely legal, on what me and everybody else, what we're looking for in terms of hiring. You know, how to present yourself and how to think about every time you apply to something as even if you don't get the job or if you get the job and uh, don't accept it, I think about how you want to build it up as a collaboration. Okay? Every time you meet someone, that's a possible collaborator. Okay? And try and build those bridges. And uh, like I said, we're really happy. We have a brand new building. Uh, all, uh, we are independent of the department, so we've got people from, does it say so here? Yeah, we've got people from computer science, from mechanical engineering, electrical engineering, and we're all put, put in there together. And, uh, and that's what's wonderful about it. And we have a huge commitment from the university. So if you want to talk about this, we'd be happy to talk to you.